When you think of America, the words from sea to shining sea come to mind. America, in all its glory, stretches wide across the span of the continent, but it wasn't always that way. At the birth of our country, we were a small strip of land that extended barely 50 miles from the coastline and laid across 430,000 square miles. Compared to our present day 3.5 million square miles and 2,680 mile long width, we were tiny. No one in their wildest dreams could have imagined it would grow to become the country it is today, except one man. President Thomas Jefferson, before anyone else, dreamed this dream. He believed in a coast-to-coast -coast empire of liberty that all countries would look to in awe. Jefferson's ambitions were the beginning of a new America, but it all started with the birth of two little boys. In 1770, a boy by the name of William Clark was born. Four years later, a boy named Meriwether Lewis. Just two boys, born apart and without connection, but they would grow up to be some of the most important explorers in American history. On March 16, 1801, Meriwether Lewis became the personal secretary of Thomas Jefferson. They quickly developed a strong bond of trust, Jefferson relying upon Lewis for many things. Lewis was Jefferson's right-hand man. He lived in the White House with Jefferson, and he was Jefferson's hand-picked man for almost every job. So it comes as no surprise that when Jefferson went to Congress to ask for funding for an expedition to the West on January 18, 1803, Lewis was his first choice to lead it. He began his training that spring, and contrary to popular belief, it was later that year, on July 4, 1803, that the Louisiana Purchase was announced. Most people think Lewis was sent out to explore the Louisiana Territory, but in truth, Jefferson was going to send an expedition out whether that land was owned by the U.S. or not. Jefferson wanted to know what was out there. He was a very smart man, but the land west of the Missouri was only myth and fable. He, and many others, believed there were woolly mammoths, mountains of pure salt, and erupting volcanoes to the west. He even thought there were blue-eyed Indians who spoke Welsh languages. Jefferson wanted to know what could be in his empire of liberty, and Jefferson especially wanted to know if the North Passage existed. Like everything else, it was only speculation at this time, but Jefferson believed in it wholeheartedly. A passageway of water from the East Coast to the West Coast, allowing for trade and transportation, would place great power in the hands of any country that held it. So in the summer of 1803, Lewis gathered a crew of rugged men to travel West and a co-captain to help him govern it, William Clark, Lewis's former commanding officer in the military. Together, they established Camp Wood in the winter of 1803 and began the journey that would forever change America on March 14, 1804. It was five long months before the first and only tragic death of the journey occurred. Sergeant Charles Floyd, just outside present-day Sioux City, Iowa, was laid to rest after his illness, widely believed to be appendicitis, took a turn for the worst. His death, though unfortunate, serves as a testament to the success of the expedition. Only one man died throughout the length of a two-year journey, and he would have died no matter where he was in the world. Charles Floyd, had he turned down the adventure, would have died that same way in his house. The expedition, though it was hard for everyone, moved on holding Floyd in their hearts. They reached the Great Plains early September that year, where they discovered several species of plants and animals unknown in the eastern United States. Many of them are animals we know well today, such as grizzly bears, bison, and coyotes. The Corps kept detailed sketches of these animals in their journals, collecting and sending back samples of furs, claws, and leaves to Jefferson. They even caught a live prairie dog to send to Jefferson. Using buckets of water and the help of the entire group, Lewis managed to catch and capture a live prairie dog. He boxed it up in a crate, sending it on a near eight-month journey back to the White House. Surprisingly, it made it alive, with the help from a caretaker, of course, to Jefferson along with many other samples. In October, after another month of traveling through the wilderness, the Corps arrived at the Mandan and Hadatsa villages along the Missouri River. There they met a French-Canadian fur trader named Toussaint Charbonneau, hiring him and his Shoshone wife, Sacagawea, as interpreters for the mission. Sacagawea, one of the most well-known female characters in American history, was the only woman in the expedition. She contributed largely by interpreting for the Indian peoples the expedition came across, including her own village, which she was taken away from as a child. The men quickly set to work building Fort Mandan, where they would stay for the winter. Finished on December 24, 1804, the fort became their winter camp, where they could finally sleep under a roof during the freezing nights. They stayed there for a month, trading and becoming well acquainted with the Indian people. Though this part of their mission is often forgotten, 
Jefferson wanted the court to establish bonds with the Indian peoples. While they didn't always get along, as in the case of the Teton Sioux, by the time January came around, the Mandan and Hidatsa peoples and the Corps had strong bonds, something even akin to friendship. They relied upon the Indian people for food, and in turn they gave them items unattainable in the West, such as blue dye and beads. But soon the Corps had to continue on its way, and in January 1805, the expedition attended a Mandan buffalo dance to send them on their way. As the title suggests, this was a scene of festivity for all. There was a feast, and everyone ate and drank and was merry, while a campfire blazed in the center. The Mandan chiefs, to show their trust, even allowed Lewis and Clark to sleep with their wives, who were wearing nothing but a robe. That morning, they set off with new supplies and full bellies, but one was fuller than the rest. Sacagawea was carrying a child, Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, who was born three months later on February 11, 1805. Clark, who helped Sacagawea give birth to the child, took a special liking to him, fondly naming him Pompey. The entire crew came to love and protect the little child, and he became one of the brightest points of the trip. Soon after, they reached the White Cliffs region of the Missouri River. It took the Corps almost two months to reach three forks of the Missouri, naming them as the Jefferson, the Gallatin, and the Madison, in honor of the President, the Secretary of Treasury, and the Secretary of State. The expedition finally, with much disappointment, realized the North Passage didn't exist on August 12, 1805, when Lewis reached the headwaters of the Missouri River. Such an important part of the mission, a main reason for the expedition, and it didn't exist. But they had to carry on, so on October 7, 1805, the expedition pushed off down the Clearwater River, traveling with the current for the first time in almost two years. Nine days later, on October 16th, the Corps reached the Columbia River, the last waterway to the Pacific Ocean. They finally accomplished their goal on November 7, 1805. The men were ecstatic, Lewis writing, Ocean in view, oh the joy. They had finally made it, after two hard years of travel and fatigue, of cold nights and sweltering days of pushing and rowing, they found their way to the Pacific Ocean. They had completed their mission. They set up camp, later to be called Fort Clatsop, where they spent a long winter before finally setting off toward home on March 23, 1806. After their two-and-a-half-year journey, the men reached St. Louis and were named National Heroes. On September 23, 1806, they were finally home. After the return of Lewis and Clark, much more information was given to the public about the West. President Jefferson was devastated by the non-existence of the Northwest Passage, but the expedition did wield many successful discoveries, both scientific and geographic. Lewis and Clark were rewarded greatly for their services, each receiving land and double pay. Jefferson appointed Lewis governor of the territory of Copper, Louisiana on March 1807, and Clark was appointed general of militia and superintendent of Indian affairs for the territory of Upper Louisiana. In 1813, Clark was appointed governor of the Missouri Territory, a position he held until 1820. After Lewis's tragic death on October 11, 1809, the expedition journals were sent to Clark, who turned them over to an editor named Nicholas Biddle. The journals were presented to the public in 1814, ten years after the Corps began its journey. Clark continued his work in Indian Affairs and was known for his fair treatment of Native Americans until his death on December 1st, 1838, in St. Louis, Missouri. Lewis and Clark established the American claim to the Northwest. They discovered over 100 new animal species and 150 new plant species, and mapped the lands with incredible accuracy for their time. The expedition was a learning experience about Native American cultures and open trade with many Native American tribes. The Corps of Discovery started a new age of exploration the explorers after them looking to their maps and sketches for guidance. They were the first to go into the unknown, and their insight led many others west. America spent over 100 years following in their footsteps, finally spreading across the continent as the United States we know today. Their legacy lives on in the United States itself, the empire of liberty we know today. It is a true American story, one every child knows. America would not be the same without the two little boys, born apart and without connection, who grew up to change history forever.